Okay, so today we are going to talk about uh, demand and supply model. And as we talk about demand and supply, these are the things that we will cover. We will first talk about what is demand. Then we will talk about how do we move from individual to market demand. Then we will talk about the determinants of demand. Next we will talk about what is supply, look at the determinants of supply. Once we have talked about both demand and supply and their determinants, then we will bring demand and supply together and we will talk about the dynamics of demand and supply in a market. So those are the few things that we will uh, cover today. The demand side, if I refresh your memory from the first chapter from lecture note 1, we talked about the foundation principles in economics in lecture note 1 and we said that when we look at the interaction of economic agents, whenever we look at the interaction of individuals in a society, we divide them into two groups, that is the buyer side also known as the consumers or the demanders and the seller side also known as the producers or the suppliers. And then when these two groups interact and come to an agreement point, we get the equilibrium in the market. So in this chapter, we are specifically going to look at the perspective of the buyers, how do buyers react when they come to a market and then the perspective of the sellers, how do the sellers react when they come to the same market and eventually we are going to bring the two sides together and look at the interaction of the buyers and the sellers and how they can affect each other and how they can affect the market as a whole. So that will be the agenda for this chapter. Now talking about the demand side, now this is pretty intuitive. Whenever you go to a market, as an individual, any of us go to the market, we have two things in mind. We want a certain quantity of a good and we also have a certain amount in our mind that we are willing to pay for that good. For example, if you want to buy a pound of apples, you go to the market, you know that you want to buy a pound of apples. So one pound is the quantity that you want to buy and then you also have a certain willingness to pay. By willingness to pay I mean how much you are willing to pay for that pound of apples. So as demanders those are the first two parameters that we go to a market with. The quantity that we want to buy and the willingness to pay for that quantity. Now when we go to the market our willingness to pay may or may not match with the market price of the commodity. As in when you walk into the store with a willingness to pay of let's say two dollars for a pound of apples, you may see that the market price, the actual price of the apples may be two dollars. That means it could match your willingness to pay. It could be more than two dollars. That means it is higher than your willingness to pay or it could be less than two dollars. That is it is lower than your willingness to pay. 
Now, as a customer, as a consumer, you will end up buying the commodity, you will end up buying the pound of apples if your willingness to pay is either equal to the market price or if your willingness to pay is higher than the market price. That means, if in the first place you are willing to pay two dollars for the pound of apples, you will buy the pound of apples if you see that the price is exactly two dollars or if you see that the market price is anything less than two dollars, then you end up taking your buying decision. So that means your willingness to pay kind of has to adjust to the level of the market price for you to take a buying decision in the market. Now in the demand side, we are talking about the perspective of the buyers and we are trying to see how would buyers react to price and quantity in a market. How would they adjust their quantity demanded in response to the market price. That is what we are looking at in the demand side. Once again reiterating, now we are not talking about the sellers at all. We are just talking about the buyers or the consumers also known as the demanders and we are trying to see how would these group of economic agents respond when they see a certain price in the market. How would they adjust their buying decision? How would they adjust their quantity demanded in response to the market price of a commodity? So let's say you walk into a market and you see that the price of the commodity is dollar P1. It could be anything, $5, $10, $1,000. And at that price, your quantity demanded is Q1. So that is the quantity. It could be any units, 5 units, 10 units, 15 units of the commodity. That is how much you want to buy at the dollar price P1. Now let's say the price of the commodity goes up to P2. That means we are saying that P2 is a higher price than P1. Now think about it for a second. Whenever that happens to you in the market, whenever you are faced by a higher price, you always, most of the times, you want to adjust your buying decision by buying a lesser quantity of the commodity right now. That means whenever your price goes up, your quantity demanded tends to come down such that your Q2 would be less than Q1. So once again, what I'm trying to say is if your price increases, if your P2 is greater than P1, then your quantity demanded tends to be lower, that is your Q2 is lower than Q1. Now on the contrary, if the price is P3 such that P3 is less than P1, that means now you are faced by a lower price, then you change your quantity decision again. Now you tend to buy Q3 where your Q3 is greater than Q1. So whenever the price goes down, you adjust your decision of buying by buying more. And whenever the price go, goes up, you adjust your decision of buying by buying less. In other words, I'm trying to say that there is an inverse relationship between the price and quantity. Whenever price goes up, quantity demanded comes down. Whenever price goes down, the quantity demanded goes up. Everything else in the market staying the same. Everything else staying the same. That means we are not assuming any other changes in the market. We, if you are just looking at the price and quantity, then you are able to see this inverse relationship between price and quantity. Now this everything else is also called ceteris paribus. You will see in the textbook that this is called ceteris paribus. So if we assume that nothing else in the market has changed and you will see as we go forward what are those other things that I am talking about. If we assume that everything else in the market stays the same, then there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity. As price of the commodity goes up, the quantity demanded comes down and as the price of the commodity goes down, the quantity demanded goes up and this inverse relationship is also known as the law of demand.
So, law of demand formally tells you that everything else in the market staying the same, there is an inverse relationship between the price of the commodity and the quantity demanded by the buyers of the commodity. Now, next let us move on and see how would this demand, law of demand look like if we wanted to plot this relationship on a graph, on a two dimensional graph. If you just wanted to take a two dimensional graph and see this law of demand relationship, what would it look like? So, let us draw a two dimensional graph. Here we take the price of the commodity, so it is the dollar price. Here we have the quantity of the commodity which is in units and it could be any commodity, apples, oranges, textbooks, anything. So, all we are saying is if the price of the good is say dollar P1, then the quantity demanded for the good is Q1 units. If the price rises to anything like P2, then your quantity demanded is lower, something like Q2. And if the price falls to something like P3, then your quantity demanded tends to be higher, something like Q3. Now, that is the relationship that we just spoke about, the inverse relationship. Now, when you plot this inverse relationship and you draw a line through all those points of price and quantity relationship, then you get a downward sloping line and that downward sloping line is nothing but your demand curve. So, the demand curve is nothing but a graphical representation of the law of demand. The demand curve has nothing to do with any other parameters in the market. Please note, I repeat, the demand curve has nothing to do with any other parameters in the market. It just tells you the relationship between price and quantity demanded in the market from the perspective of the buyers. In other words, it is a graphical representation of the law of demand which states that ceteris paribus, nothing else changing in the market, there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity. Okay? Now, in this class, we are going to call this demand curve, always we are going to call it the D curve. So, we are not going to write demand curve each time. Whenever I say it is the D curve, it means I am talking about the demand curve. Now, let us go one notch deeper and see why we get this inverse relationship or what is the mechanism that is followed when we get this inverse relationship. Let us just say you have that relationship that we just spoke, uh, talked about, the inverse relationship and you have a demand schedule that looks like that, you have a demand curve that looks like that, the D curve. Now, we are trying to see what is the mechanism behind this demand curve, this downward sloping demand curve. Why do we get this downward sloping demand curve? Now, if there is an increase in the price, if price goes up to dollar P2, then the mechanism that is followed is an upward movement or an upward slide along the demand curve so that the quantity demanded goes down to Q2. Similarly, if the price drops to P3, then there is a downward movement or a downward slide along the demand curve as a result of which the quantity demanded rises to Q3. So, all I am trying to say is whenever there is an increase or a decrease in price, what you get is a movement along the demand curve. Movement along the demand curve. And due to this movement along the demand curve, there is a change in quantity demanded. Okay. So, whenever the price of the commodity changes 
all you can get is a movement along the demand curve and as a result of the movement there is a change in quantity demanded. So once again if we try to make this a little bit more specific then we can say that as price goes up there is an upward movement along D curve and as a result of that the quantity demanded which is the Q goes down and similarly if price of the commodity goes down then you get a downward movement along D curve as a result of which the quantity demanded that is the Q goes up. Now this is for you to remember always. Okay, this is never going to change, this is always going to be true. So when you just look at this part and that part of the relationship, when you look at the extreme left and the extreme right of this relationship, it tells you about the law of demand, the inverse relationship. And when you look at the middle part, that is basically the mechanism that leads to the law of demand. So always when there is a price change, there will be a change in quantity demanded and the change in quantity demanded happens through either a movement upward or a movement downward along the same demand curve. Remember we started by talking about the price and the quantity relationship in a certain market that is the apples market and we were talking about how an individual buyer would respond to the prices in the market. How would an individual buyer adjust his quantity demanded in response to the prices in the market. So that means this demand curve that we were just talking about, it is the demand curve for a particular good, for example apples and it is the demand curve of an individual, for example it could be my demand curve or it could be your demand curve, right? So basically we were talking about an individual's demand curve, so it is an individual demand curve and we were also talking about a certain market, so we are talking about the market for a commodity and it could be any commodity, in our example it was apples. So, all the discussion that we just did, the law of demand and the inverse relationship between price and quantity, the law of demand and the inverse relationship between price and quantity, all this was with respect to an individual's decision, an individual's adjustment of quantity demanded in the market for a certain commodity. Now let us say that individual is let us give a name to the individual. So here we are measuring price, here we are measuring quantity, here we this is the market for apples. So let us write this is apples market and let us say this individual is Joe. So what based on the discussion that we just did, maybe if the price in the market is $5, then Joe wants to buy say 3 pounds of apples, 3 units of apples. If the price rises to $7, then by the law of demand, Joe should want to buy less. So let us say Joe buys 2 pounds and if the price drops to say $3 and I am just cooking up these numbers, these are all arbitrary numbers, it could be anything. So it is not drawn to scale or anything. So let us say if the price drops then the quantity demanded for Joe goes up to something like 
let us say 5 pounds, right. So, the inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded holds for Joe. So, you will see a downward sloping demand curve for Joe. In other words, Joe follows the law of demand. Similarly, I could draw the demand curve for another individual, let us say Mary. So, Mary also goes to the same market. So, that means Mary is faced by the same prices, seven dollars. $5 and $3 because no matter who is buying, the price of the commodity faced by the individual is still the same. If you walk into a store to buy apples and why walk into the same store to buy the same apples, then the price that you see is the same as the price that I would see. So, both the customers, both the consumers, Mary and Joe, they both face the same price points in the market. However, how much they want to buy at that price is going to be very different because they are two different individuals, uh, so their buying decisions might be different. For example, at 5 pounds, maybe Mary wants to buy 6 pounds of apples. If the price drops, then she probably wants to buy 8 pounds of apples. And if the price rises, then maybe she wants to buy four pounds of apples. So, it is her decision because she is a different individual. So, although she is faced by the same price points, her decision to buy, her quantity demanded at those price points may be very different. But please note that even Mary has that inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded because she is also a rational buyer. She is not a crazy person. So, obviously, if the price goes up, she is going to buy less and if the price goes down, she is going to buy more. In other words, Mary also follows the law of demand and Mary's demand curve also looks like that it is a downward sloping line. So, that means individually both Joe and Mary follow the law of demand. Their individual demands are not violating the law of demand. Now, let us say, let us assume that there are only these two buyers in the market for apples. These are the only two buyers of apples in the market. So, if I wanted to draw a market demand curve for apples, then all I would have to do is to horizontally sum up the demand, the individual demand of Joe and the individual demand of Mary to get the market demand curve for apples. In other words, what I am trying to say is, the market demand curve is a horizontal summation of all individual demand curves of all buyers in that particular market. I repeat, the market demand curve is a horizontal summation of all individual demand curves of all buyers in that market. So, in this market, in the apples market, we assume that there are only these two buyers, Joe and Mary. So, if I had to get the market demand curve for apples, I would horizontally sum them up. So, I would still have the quantity here, I would have the price there and I would still have those three price points that is $7, uh, $5 and $3. But at $5 now, the quantity demanded would be 3 plus 6 that is 9. So, 3 plus 6, that is 9 pounds. At 7 dollars, the quantity demanded would be 2 plus 4, that is 6 dollars, uh, 6 pounds. 2 plus 4, that is 6 pounds. I am just summing the quantities up. And at 3 dollars, it would be 5 plus 8, that is 13 dollars, uh, 13 pounds, I keep saying dollars. Anyway, so it is at 3 dollars, it is 8 plus 5, that is 13 pounds. Now, please note what was true for the two individuals is also true for the market. At 5 dollars, you want 9 pounds. At 7 dollars, the quantity demanded in the market is lower. 
and at a lower price three dollars the quantity demanded in the market is higher and if you draw a line through all those price and quantity relationships then you get the demand curve for the market the market demand curve right and you can see that the law of demand not only holds at the level of the individuals but it also holds at the level of the market in other words everything else staying the same there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity for individual buyers and when you sum up that sum that up for all buyers of the commodity then you get that same inverse relationship also in the market for that commodity now in the real world there are not just two buyers of a commodity right there are millions and millions of buyers but it is exactly the same process to get to the market demand curve if you had a market for textbooks then the market demand curve would be the horizontal summation of all individual demand curves for all buyers of textbooks in that particular market so the rule is still the same no matter how many buyers you have in the market now going forward in this chapter we are no longer worried about the individual demand curves of individual buyers rather now we are just interested in the market demand curve right so every time we draw the demand curve from now on we are basically drawing the demand curve for the market of the commodity and not for an individual buyer however at the back of your mind always remember that whatever is true at the individual level is true at the level of the market because individuals as well as the market both follow the law of demand next we are going to talk about the determinants of this demand what are the things that really affect the demand for a commodity now let's say let me represent the demand for a commodity as capital d so that is the demand for a commodity so the demand for a commodity depends on the price of the commodity and i'm calling that own price because later on as we proceed we are also going to talk about price of some other commodities so kind of to distinguish between the different prices that we talk about let me make sure that you understand that own price is the price of the commodity in question so if you're talking about apples this is the price of apples if you're talking about textbooks this is the price of textbooks okay so the own price of the commodity and then you have some non price factors and we will go through those non price factors but just to begin just to start off please understand that so far we were talking about this relationship we were talking about what is the relationship between the price of the commodity and the quantity demanded for the commodity and we agreed that there is an inverse relationship between the quantity demanded and the price whenever the price goes down the quantity demanded goes up whenever the price goes up the quantity demanded goes down and all of this happens because of the law of demand or this inverse relationship in itself is called the law of demand and the mechanism that causes it is a movement along d curve right and as a result of this you have a change in quantity demanded now as we are looking at this part of the relationship as we are looking at the relationship between own price and the quantity demanded for the commodity remember we said that ceteris paribus holds that means everything else in the market stays constant now that everything else that we are referring to is basically these non price factors so whenever we are looking at the relationship between 
the quantity demanded and the change in the price of the commodity, we are assuming that everything else in the market stays constant and by everything else we are referring to these non-price factors. In other words, the law of demand has nothing to do with the non-price factors in the market because we are assuming that those non-price factors stay unchanged when we are just talking about the law of demand. Okay? So the movement along the demand curve is only about the demand about the quantity demanded and the price of a good, how they react, how they respond to each other. Now, when we look at the other side of the relationship, when we look at the relationship between demand and the non-price factors, assuming that now the price of the commodity is constant, that is the unchanged part. So there is no change in the price of the commodity, but there is change in some other non-price factors in the commodity, then we are basically looking at demand shifter or a shift in the demand, which is also called a change in demand. Okay. So, so far we were talking about a law of demand, we were talking about movement along the same demand curve, there was no concept of shift and we are looking at a change in quantity demanded and we were assuming the non-price factors in the market were constant. But now we are looking at the other side of the relationship and we are looking at the relationship between the non-price factors in the market and the demand in the market assuming that the price in the market is unchanged and that part of the relationship takes us to the shifts of the demand curve. Please note, now we are not talking anymore about the movement but we are talking about shifts, the shifts of the demand curve and that is also known as change in demand. So once again, I want to reiterate when the price changes with no other change in the market, you get a movement along the same demand curve and that is called a change in quantity demanded. When you look at the other side of the relationship, that is price is unchanged and some other factor in the market changes, then you get a shift of the demand curve and that is also called a change in demand. Okay? Now let us go through what are some of these non-price factors in the market. What are these non-price factors that we are talking about? So all along we are going to assume that there is no change in the price and something else is changing in the market and those something else are the non-price factors. Now I like to use this word to remember the non-price factors that affect demand in a market. Now once again just letting you know that this is not from a textbook. So this word is just an acronym that I coined because I like to remember it that way and you might benefit by remembering uh, it this way. So I like to use the word tribe. So if you go outside and you say okay demand is affected by tribe, nobody understands. Okay, So you need to understand what is actually tribe. So T stands for the tastes or preferences of buyers. Since we are on the demand side, we are only worried about buyers. We don't care about sellers yet. When we talk about related R, it is about related goods. So R stands for related goods. And we are worried about the price of related goods. So see, now we are talking about the price of related goods. So that's why it was important here to kind of make sure what price we are talking about. So this price, the related goods price is different from the price of the commodity in question. This is own price. That means the price of apples, whereas related goods price is the price of some other commodities that could be related to apples. Okay. Now the third one is income and once again since we are on the buyer side, on the demand side, that's why we are talking about the income of buyers. The fourth one is buyers. By buyers we mean the number of buyers in the market and E stands for expectations. Expectations. 
once again it is expectation of buyers between because we are on the demand side. So, we care about buyers here. So, it is expectation of buyers about future own price. That means, it is the expectation of the buyers about the price in the future. Please note that the price today, the price right now is still constant. That assumption is not violated, right? But some of those other factors are changing which will actually cause a shift in the demand. So, next we are going to talk about each of these factors. Please note that I will not talk about the changes in each, each case in detail because I am going to post a, a, a picture, I am going to post graphs that show you the changes in each case for uh, you know how uh, the demand will increase or decrease for each of those factors. I will post graphs for that. So, I will not go through each case in detail, but I will make sure you understand uh, what we are talking about. So, let us say we are first talking about T which stands for the taste of buyers. Okay. Let us say you have a market for maybe ice cream. So, that is the commodity in question now and the law of demand holds in this market. So, you have a downward sloping demand curve. Let us say this is the initial price for ice cream. Let us say it is 5 dollars and at 5 dollars the quantity demanded for ice cream is maybe 10 ice creams. Okay. Now, let us say the price is constant. There is no change in price. It is still the same 5 dollars. Now, given that price 5 dollars, there is some other change and that some other change is in the taste or preference of the consumers. For example, let us say it is scorching summer. It is extremely hot. There is no change in the price of ice creams, but just because it is summer time and it is very hot, more buyers may now prefer to have ice creams. So, as a result of that, given that same price of ice creams at all prices, at all relevant prices of ice creams, now more buyers want to eat ice creams. So, as a result of that, you will see a rightward shift of the demand curve to something like D dash. So, D dash is a new demand curve, which is a shifted demand curve because of the increase in demand for ice creams and that increase once again has been generated due to the season, summer. Now, at that same price 5 dollars, now you have a higher quantity demanded for ice creams. Please note that this change has not happened through a movement, but this change has happened through a shift and the change of the demand curve from the original D to a new demand curve D dash, right? So, we can say that whenever there is an increase in demand, there will be a right shift of D curve and as a result of that, the quantity demanded will go up. Now, that is known as a change in demand. Please note that whenever the demand curve shifts, that is called a change in demand. A movement along the demand curve is only a change in quantity demanded. It is not a change in demand. So, demand is actually referring to the curve and whenever the curve shifts to a new position and you have a new curve like D dash, that is called a change in demand. So, this is a change in demand, right? So, whenever you have an increase in demand, there will be an increase in quantity demanded and the mechanism through which that happens is a right shift of the D curve. Similarly, let us say alternatively the price is still the same 5 dollars, but now it is winter season. It is winters, so people many buyers do not prefer to have ice creams in winter. So, given that same price 5 dollars, now less people want to have ice creams as a result of that you have a new demand curve D double dash 
and at that same given price five dollars you have now have a lower quantity demanded something like five ice creams right so once again the same thing as demand goes down so this demand is going down because of season and the preference of the customers there is a decrease in the quantity demanded and this is happening through a mechanism of left shift of the D curve. Okay. Please note that all along whenever the demand is increasing and the quantity is changing, the demand is decreasing and the quantity is changing, the own price of the commodity, the price of ice creams is still the same. So what is triggering this change is not the price of ice creams but something else a non price factor which in this case is the taste or preference of the buyers. Okay. Now let me just uh, make sure you understand that this part of the relationship is always going to be true no matter which factor causes it. No matter which non price factor you are dealing with this part of the relationship is always the same. As demand increases, there is going to be an increase in quantity demanded and that, that happens through a right shift. Whenever the demand decreases, that leads to a decrease in the quantity demanded and that happens through a left shift of the demand curve. That is always going to be true, no matter which factor you are dealing with. You could have T here, you could have related goods here, you could have income of buyers here, but the relationship that you see here a right shift for an increase in demand and a resulting increase in quantity demanded, a left shift for a decrease in demand and a resulting decrease in the quantity demanded, that part is always going to be the same and the price of the commodity is constant that is also going to be true no matter which non-price factor you are talking about. Now let us go on to the next factor. So now we are going to talk about the related goods. So we now talk about the price of related goods. Now there can be two kinds of related goods. One is substitute and the other is complement. Okay. Now substitute is anything that is an alternative for the good, that is a substitute. So maybe for ice cream a substitute or an alternative is frozen yogurt. So if you are dealing with ice cream, the substitute would be a frozen yogurt. And complement, please note a complement is anything that goes along with this first good, right. So they always go hand in hand. They are consumed together. So if you are talking about ice cream, maybe the cones are a complement. The ice cream cone is a complement. Okay? So good examples of substitutes would be like the different brands. If you are talking about sports shoes, then Nike and Adidas, those are substitutes or Skechers, those are substitutes. For complements, good examples would be something like wine and cheese, they go together or pizza and soda, they go together. Please note that those are two different goods but they are just consumed together that is why they are complements. Please make sure that you understand the difference between something like sugar and soda and pizza and soda. For example, if you are talking about sugar and soda, sugar goes into making soda, right? So when you are having soda, it is not like you are having a fistful of sugar along with that, right? The sugar goes into making soda, so that is not a complement because when you are drinking soda, you are only drinking the soda the sugar has no existence anymore, it has gone into making the soda. But when you are talking about soda and pizza, then both the commodities have retained their identity and you are jointly consuming the two commodities. So that would be an example of complement, right? The best examples, for example, the marker and the whiteboard, you have a plank of wood and a hammer, so those are all complementary goods. Now let us call the price of the substitute, let us call that as P sub and the price of the complement let us call that as P com. Okay? So the good that we are dealing with is still ice creams that is our primary good. Now let us say that the price of frozen yogurt has gone up 
So, if there is an increase in the price of the substitute, what do you expect to see in the market for ice creams? That is the question that we are trying to answer. So, if the price of frozen yogurt goes up, then obviously people now do not want to have frozen yogurt and if people are indifferent between frozen yogurt and ice cream, then more people will now want to have ice creams. Please note that nothing has happened to the price of ice creams per se. In the ice cream market, there is no change in the price. The price of ice cream is still maybe that $5 and that's the demand curve. So you still have that $5 price for ice cream. But since the price of the substitute or the frozen yogurt went up, that's why people now don't want to have frozen yogurt and maybe more people now want to have ice cream. So there is an increase in demand for ice creams. With no change in the price of ice creams, the quantity demanded for ice creams has gone up on the x-axis, right? Similarly, if the price of the substitute good, if the price of the frozen yogurt goes down, then more people are now comfortable having frozen yogurt. So they do not buy ice creams. Once again, with no change in the price of ice creams, the price of ice creams is still the same, but there is a decrease in demand for ice creams because people now want to buy more frozen yogurt, so they are not eating as many ice creams, so the demand for ice cream goes down. Once again, please note that this relationship is still the same. When the price of the substitute went up, the demand for the good in question went up and you got a right shift and an increase in quantity demanded for ice creams. Similarly, when the price of the substitute went down, then you had a decrease in the demand for ice creams. As a result of that, there was a left shift and hence a decrease in the quantity demanded for ice creams. So if we have to summarize this relationship, your takeaway from here is if the price of the substitute good rises, then that leads to an increase in the demand for your good in question or in other words, we are talking about a right shift and as a result of that, the quantity demanded also goes up, right? So if the price of frozen yogurt goes up, then the demand for ice cream goes up. That's a right shift of the demand curve for ice creams. As a result of that, the quantity demanded for ice creams would go up. Similarly, if the price of substitute goes down, then the demand for the good ice cream goes down. That's a left shift of the demand curve for ice creams as a result of which the quantity of ice creams bought and sold, the quantity of ice creams demanded would go down. Once again, this relationship is always going to be true. As long as you're dealing with a substitute good, this is always going to be true. An increase in the price of substitute is going to take the demand for your good up a decrease in the price of a substitute good is going to take the demand for your good down. Now let's talk about the complements. What do you see in case of a complement? Now in case of complements, remember we are talking about goods that are jointly consumed. For example, ice cream cones. Now if the price of cone goes up, if the price of the complement goes up, then obviously you do not buy that good, you do not buy cones. And if you don't buy cones, you also do not buy ice creams because they are jointly consumed, right? Similarly, if the price of cones go down, then you now want to buy cones and at the same time, you also want to buy more ice creams because once again, they are jointly consumed. So that means now we see a relationship that looks like that. If the price of a complement goes up, then the demand for the good in question goes down. So that's a left shift of the demand curve. As a result of that, the quantity demanded for the good goes down. Please note, each time we are not talking about any changes in the price of ice cream. The price of ice cream is constant. That is the implicit assumption every time. And if the price of complement goes down, 
then you see a rise in the demand for the good in question. So that is a right shift. So every time the demand goes up, it is a right shift. Every time the demand goes down, it is a left shift. And as a result of that, the quantity demanded goes up. Right? So we are saying as price of cone increases, as the price of cone increases, the demand for ice creams go down with no change in the price of ice creams. There is a left shift of the demand curve for ice creams and the quantity demanded for ice cream goes down. The opposite would happen if the price of cones went down. Now for each case, like I said, I am not drawing a diagram, I am not drawing a graph for each case because I am going to post these graphs uh, for you online. So you will see it, I will post them on blackboard. So you will be able to see exactly what I mean by um, you know a right shift of the demand curve or a left shift of the demand curve. But please remember that every time that we are talking about the shifts of the demand curve, whether it is to the right or to the left, the price of the good is always constant and it is something else that is causing the shift of the demand. Whenever the demand is increasing, it is a right shift and whenever the demand is decreasing, it is going to be a left shift of the demand curve. Now let us move on to the next factor, the next demand shifter which is I or the income of the buyers. Now, once again, think intuitively about it. If your income goes up, then obviously you tend to buy more of any commodity. If you have more income, you will buy more cars. If you have more income, you will probably buy more clothes, more shoes. And that is true for most of us. For most buyers, this relationship is true. As you earn more, you buy more. Has anything happened to the price of the commodity? The answer is no. Nothing has happened to the price of the commodity, but just because I am earning more, I am buying more. So I can say that for most commodities, as income rises, the demand goes up. There is a right shift of the demand curve because we just mentioned that as demand increases, always there is going to be a right shift. And as a result of that, the quantity demanded is always going to go up. Similarly, if income goes down, then people do not have enough money to buy, so they will buy less, the demand goes down, nothing has happened to the price of the commodity, there is a left shift of the demand curve and as a result of that, the quantity demanded will go down. Now this relationship is true for most commodities that you see around your cells and those commodities are all called normal goods. So this relationship between income and demand is true for most commodities that you see around your cells and those commodities are known as normal goods. So for normal goods, as income goes up, demand goes up. As income goes down, demand goes down. For example, ice cream. Ice cream is probably a normal good. If you have more money, you probably eat ice creams more often and you buy more ice creams. If you have less money, if you have less earnings, then you probably do not buy ice creams as often and you eat less ice creams. But there is also another category of goods which are qualitatively inferior goods, just like the name suggests. And those goods are called inferior goods. They are not normal, they are inferior. The inferior goods. The example of inferior goods would be something like maybe thrift store clothes. or something like used cars, really old used cars or something like ramen noodles, that is a classic example. So anything that is qualitatively inferior, that is an inferior good. Now if you are dealing with inferior good, 
then as your income goes up, if you earn more, then obviously you do not want to buy more of the inferior goods because you want to buy some other good which is qualitatively superior. So, if income goes up, the demand for the inferior good goes down. In other words, there is a left shift of the demand curve and the quantity demanded goes down. Contrarily, if there is a fall in the income, if you earn less, then you have no other option but to buy the qualitatively inferior good. So, you buy more of that good, the inferior good, because you cannot afford the superior ones. So, you see a right shift in the demand for inferior good as a result of which the quantity goes up. Now, please note once again, whether we are talking about normal goods or inferior goods, nothing has happened to the price of the good. The price of the good, the own price of the good is still constant, but what is changing is the income of the buyers. In case of normal goods, if the buyer earns more, they buy more. If the buyer earns less, they buy less. But for inferior goods, when the income is higher, the demand is lower, but the income is lower, then the demand is higher. So, in case of normal goods, you have a direct relationship between income and demand for the good. In case of inferior goods, you have an inverse relationship between income and the demand for the goods. That means, you need to look out in your question whether the commodity that is given to you is mentioned as normal or inferior. If you are being asked about an inferior good, the question will specifically tell you that, okay, this good is inferior. And if nothing is mentioned, then you just assume that good to be normal. If you are not told anything, then the good is normal. If it is inferior, you will be specifically given that information in the question. Okay. Now, moving on, the next one is the number of buyers. The next factor that affects demand is B or number of buyers. Now, once again, that is pretty intuitive. If you have more buyers in the market, you have more demand. If you have less buyers in the market, you have less demand. Think about the market for textbooks. At the beginning of the semester, the price of the textbook is $100, but more people want to buy the textbooks because it is beginning of the semester, so the demand is high. So, higher the number of buyers, higher is the demand. That is referring to a right shift because nothing has happened to the price of textbooks and the quantity demanded for textbooks is high. Now, at the middle point of the semester, people have already bought textbooks. So, the demand, the number of buyers in the market is less. Now, people do not want to buy textbooks anymore. Nothing has happened to the price. The sticker price of the textbook is still $100, but now since less buyers want to buy it, the number of buyers have gone down. So, the demand goes down. That is a left shift of the demand curve for textbooks. And as a result of that, the quantity demanded for textbooks is lower. Right? So, that is pretty intuitive. More buyers means more demand, higher quantity demanded. Less buyers means less demand and a lesser quantity demanded. Whenever we are talking about a more demand, we are referring to a right shift of the D curve. Whenever we are talking about less demand, we are talking about a left shift of the demand curve. The last and final one, which is quite important, that is the E part, which is the expectation above buyers, expectation of buyers. Now, this expectation is about the future price. So, if the buyers expect the price in the future, once again, this is own price. We are talking about own price of the commodity, but please do not uh, get puzzled here. We are not talking about a change in the price today, but we are talking about what would happen to the price tomorrow, what we expect to happen to the price tomorrow. So, so it still qualifies as a non-price factor because the price today is still constant, right? What is changing is our expectation about the price in the future. So, if we expect the prices to be higher in the future, then obviously we want to buy more today. So, as a result of that, the demand today is going to be higher because I want to buy it when the good is still cheap. I do not want to wait 
till when it becomes expensive in the future. So, I am going to buy more today. So, today I will see a right shift of the demand curve. As a result of that, the quantity demanded will be going up. And similarly, if the buyer expects the price in the future to be lower, if they expect that there will be discounts in the future, then they will hold on, they will wait till those discounts are given. So, the demand today is going to be lower. So, today there will be a left shift of the demand curve and the result of that the quantity today, the quantity demanded today will be lower. Please note that in both cases the price today is fixed, the price today is constant. Since my expectation about future price is changing, that is why my demand today is changing. So, it still qualifies as a non-price factor and results in a shift of the demand curve. A classic example of this would be around Thanksgiving sale. If your computer breaks down in the beginning of November and you do not have an emergency need for a computer, then you wait till the Thanksgiving sale, right? And if all people think that way, then the demand for computers in the beginning of November would be low because people are probably waiting for the Thanksgiving sale in the future. They know in the future the prices will be going down. The they are expecting the prices to drop in the future. So, the demand today is going to be low, right? So, that is what we are talking about here. If you know prices are going to drop in the future, your demand today is going to be low. If you know prices are going to be high in the future, then your demand today is going to be high. So, that kind of brings us to the end of the factors that affect demand with no change in the price of the commodity. Okay. So, here this is where we started. So, we were saying that if the price of the commodity is constant, that part is very important. If the price of the commodity is constant and any of those other factors change, taste, re price of related goods, income of buyers, number of buyers or expectation of buyers about future price, if any of those non-price factors change with the price being constant, then you always get a shift of the demand curve. So, these factors are also called the demand shifters because a change in these factors will always shift the demand curve. They are called demand shifters and whenever these factors change such that the demand increases, then you will always get a right shift of the demand curve. And if those factors change such that the demand falls or decreases, you will always get a left shift of the demand curve. And as a result of the right shift, the quantity demanded will always increase. With the result of a left shift, the quantity demanded will always decrease. And this is known as a change in demand. Please note, this is not a change in quantity demanded, but a change in demand. So, it is important for you to understand the difference between change in demand and change in quantity demanded. Change in quantity demanded is just this relationship, the law of demand, which is happening through a movement along the demand curve, no shift. And change in demand is essentially a shift of the demand curve when the price of the commodity, the own price of the commodity is still constant.